Canine and Feline Behaviour Association employs Britain's top seminar experts for your professional development. Seminars are exciting and stimulate new and modern ideas from Britain's top experts. Um, yeah, let me just move on. Okay, so this is how I got into this topic as a criminologist. My key area of study is gangs in, um, in, in London and uh, have a book out next year looking at that. And while I was researching into that, there was this terrible incident in April uh, 2009 where the 16-year-old boy called uh, Shea Ogunyemi was killed. And he was killed in this park here, uh, Larkhall Park, which is in South London. So you've got Vauxhall in the centre up here, and it's just a bit south, uh, Stockwell and Brixton. Um, this is where Jean-Charles de Menezes was shot. So just a few hundred yards from there. Very nice part, but uh, there are two separate gangs, one gang here and one gang there, and this is a kind of um, uh, no man's land between the two areas. Well, uh, Shea was involved in one gang, and um, he and his friend were crossing the park, and they were spotted by the rival gang. And the rival gang had their um, dogs with them, um, pit bull dogs. And as they saw Shay and his friend cross the park, they unleashed their dogs to allow the dogs to chase them. And the boys ran and they came to the edge of the park, which has a six foot fence. And um, the dogs uh, attacked them and savaged them. And uh, as they were fighting off the dogs, the guys who were in the gang arrived and stabbed Shay to death and stabbed his friend to within an inch of his life. Uh, but his friend was able to um, vault the, um, the fence and escape and Shay couldn't and he kept getting dragged back by the dogs. Uh, this was big news in London. I don't know if anybody uh, recalls it, but um, it caused quite a sensation. And as a criminologist, again, I felt as if we'd crossed a line. I felt as if uh, we were into new territory. I hadn't seen or heard of this type of thing before, and I found it very distressing and very shocking. But I wanted to look into it more deeply. And as I began to look into it more deeply, I found uh, this whole world, if you like, of status dogs and weapon dogs. And I also found that nobody had written about this before. There wasn't anything uh, written about it. And I thought that was very, very strange indeed. Because, uh, you know, as somebody who regularly listens to the, the talk radio shows in London, which are very big, and uh, reads the press, I was aware of some of the issues around the Dangerous Dogs Act and how this was becoming a big issue for people. Um, but I so I was amazed that nobody had really tackled this topic. Uh, this is a guy who was responsible for um, uh, wielding the knife and killing Shay. His name is Christian Johnson. Now he was caught, and he was caught for one particular reason. During the stabbing frenzy that went on, the, uh, his dog, this dog here, was accidentally injured and uh, was bleeding. And after the, the, the murder, um, Christian picked up his dog and there was a trail of blood that went about 500 meters all the way back to where he lived. And uh, because his dog had been microchipped recently, it was on uh, a database. Uh, so the police were able to use the DNA from his dog to identify that he was the owner and uh, take it from there. So this is, a, a, as it says here, a legal first. Uh, because the DNA from the dog was able to identify the victim. So, I mean, interesting stuff. And in criminological terms, um, again, very interesting, very interesting for us. But a very awful and shocking uh, incident. And again, there was something very similar uh, about a year later. Another 16-year-old uh, boy called Kojo Yanga in uh, northwest London. Very similar kind of scenario. So, this is my research. Um, took about four years uh, to do. It was extremely complex, sometimes dangerous, and uh, I did field work um, uh, between those particular dates. Um, 
The real challenge here in terms of uh, methodology is you cannot just go up to somebody and say, have you got this dog because you don't have any mates? <laughs> or do you, have this, do you have this dog because you're in status deficit? Um, not, not that they would understand what that meant. But, um, you know, so all of that is uh, extremely difficult to engage with in terms of um, uh, interacting with people and researching people. And there were huge ethical issues about uh, research of safety. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So I had to devise a whole um, methodology, if you like, of trying to work out what was going on in this, in this world and why dogs were being used in this way. So I began reading through the literature. There wasn't very much of it because nobody had written about this. I then did what we call in our, my world a critical discourse analysis, which basically means you get all the newspapers and then you set them out and you look at how dogs have been referred to in the press, in the headline, in the subheadline, in the text, the images that are used, etc., etc., and uh, you look at um, uh, the tabloid press and you look at the uh, broadsheet press and you try and see the, there's a difference. I then did um, uh, hospital analysis. I had to FOI Freedom of Inf Information requests to about 40 different hospitals to try and get information on dog bites, and what you find is that their data is absolutely crap. It's, uh, they don't record half the dog bites. They don't, certainly don't recall the breed of dog that's been involved. So you can't really use that information very well. So then I thought, I better go and see if I can find any of these dogs in various parks. So I visited 40 parks in 10 London boroughs um, in all weathers. Uh, very, very difficult uh, to do, to try and see if I could see these dogs. I then did a number of uh, in-depth uh, interviews with people who worked with dogs, uh, but also with professionals and residents, and then with gang-affiliated young people. And then on top of that, I did 138 interviews with the owners of these dogs. Now, it started out as 138, but um, I, I was only actually able to complete a, a much smaller number of that because um, during these interviews, uh, a variety of different things happened. So these kind of, uh, these people here, see, there you go, 33 successfully completed. So I would approach these people and I would, um, I tried different methods of approaching them. To begin with, I tried um, taking a dog with me. So I borrowed, <laughs> this, is, this is where it gets a bit crazy. Um, I thought, if I have a, have a dog, I'll be able to engage them more easily in conversation. So I don't have a dog at this point in time in my life, but uh, I borrowed a friend's red setter. <laughs> Um, and that really did not work at all it, for so many reasons. It just did not work. Uh, so I went and I found a neighbor and a neighbor said, well, I've got a staffy. And I said, well, can I borrow your staffy? So I borrowed the staffy and um, I thought for, the, for at least the first couple of interviews that was perhaps going to work. But then the do my dog would start interacting with their dog and it became distracting and I'm trying to ask questions when it's being pulled in the weed uh, and I thought no that's not going to work either um, and then unfortunately because of uh, ethical guidelines I wasn't able to um, do it covertly or secretly so I had to um, be really quite upfront with people so it took me a long time to find a way of uh, interviewing these guys and they were mostly guys not exclusively um, and then I hit on the idea that uh, I would have to engage them in conversation. And if they got chatting, I could then eventually say, look, I'm researching this, I'm studying this. Can I talk to you in more detail about it? At which point, about half of them just said, no, piss off. <laughs> or other words to that effect. Um, and then some of them would ask me for money and they'd say, yeah, I'll do it. But, you know... Um, I've, I, I want to buy some drugs around the corner, so give us 20 quid and da da da. So of course I said no to that. And, um, and then some of them I had to terminate because uh, the, the dog was beginning to be threatening. And um, I don't know if I wasn't interacting with it carefully or whatever, but it, it was becoming a bit of a worry and I terminated the, uh, 
the interview. And on a few occasions, I terminated the interview because I was threatened. Uh, halfway through, the guys who were, some of them had been smoking drugs, I think, uh, but they began to get a bit paranoid, perhaps because of the types of questions I was asking. Um, so they would get paranoid and they, they would accuse me of being from the feds, which um, for older people in the room means the police. Uh, and then on a couple of occasions, um, I, you know, they were kind of overtly threatening and threatened to set the dog on me. So um, I just had to terminate and run. <laughs> uh, so what I decided to do was I found various locations. I found parks, high streets, uh, buses, tubes, uh, public transport. And then I stood outside the Harmsworth Hospital in um, Animal Hospital in North London for uh, about two, two or three months, interviewing guys who had taken their dog there to get stitched up. Now, these are guys whose dogs have quite often been involved in fighting uh, and their dogs had been injured and they'd taken them there to get stitched up or fixed. And um, uh, Dr. David Grant, um, who's just retired, eminent um, uh, veterinary surgeon, who wrote the uh, introduction for the book, I was very pleased. Um, I interviewed him on a couple of occasions and he told me that his staff were now so fearful of the type of individuals who were coming in to uh, the, the uh, animal hospital in Harmsworth, they had had to put in CCTV, they'd had to put in shutter screens that could drop down at a press of a button, they'd put in an airlock at the entrance to the door, so you had to be buzzed in and then airlocked and then buzzed through again. You know, £10,000 worth of uh, improvements. And uh, you would go in and there were two lines of seats and chairs and you'd have, um, down one side, you'd have all these guys with their, you know, pit bull dogs or pit bull type, similar looking crossbreed dogs, anchored on chains that could anchor a ship, as far as I was concerned, all braced up with leather harnesses and studs. And then on the other side, you had all these old grannies with their little cats and things, absolutely shaking with fear. So I thought, well, this is a very strange scenario. That's not what the vets would like when I went. Um, but anyway, it was a useful source of uh, getting, the, uh, getting the information and a, a useful location.